Hello, third grade, and welcome to unit two, week three. We're going to go over our vocabulary first. Your first word is the word candidate. A candidate is a person who runs for office. So if you're thinking about the presidential candidates, those are the people who are trying to become president. If you're talking about uh, candidates for student council at school, we're talking about all the different people that want to become a part of the student council. So a candidate is a person who's running for an office or they're trying to get a certain position or job. So the candidate gave a speech or what do you think makes a good candidate? Your second word is the word convince. When you convince somebody of something, you're making that person agree with you or believe you. So my friends convince me it is the best movie. What is something you convince someone to think? So maybe you convince your friends uh, what you guys should have for dinner or which board game to play when you guys get together. So when you convince someone, you're making them agree with you or believe you. Your third word is the word independent. People who are independent think for themselves. You could be an independent, you could be independent and not join any party at all. So when we're talking about parties here, we're going back to candidates and um, how each candidate belongs to a particular group called a party. So when you're independent, that means you're not with a specific group, you're on your own. When you estimate, you make a guess based on knowledge. So when we estimate, we're guessing, but we're using the information that we have to make that guess. We're not guessing with no clues. We're using the clues and the information that we have to make a guess. Your next word is the word announced. When you announce something, you're telling people about it. You're sharing it with a large group of people. It's not a secret. So when you're watching um, a sports competition, they're going to announce the winning team. Right, they're going to say it out loud so that everybody can hear it. Your next word is the word elect. When you elect someone or something, you are choosing that by voting. So when we go into the presidential election, we're going to elect a president by voting for the one that we think is best. And then they count those votes and they use that to decide who won. So when you elect someone, you're choosing them by voting for them. Your next word is the word government. So your government is a group of people who govern, that's the word that it comes from, government comes from the word govern, or guide a city, state, or country. So the government is the group of people who help take care of or run a city, state, and country. So the government makes the laws for the country. Who is in your state's government? And your last word is the word decision. A decision is a judgment that's reached about something. So when you decide something, you're making a decision. The word decision comes from the word decide. He made a decision about what to eat for dinner, or my friends and I made a decision about what movie to watch for movie night. Now let's get into your spelling words for this week. So, oops. Unit two, week three. Now, your words for this week all focus on silent letters. Now, the silent letters that you're going to find most often are the letter W, the letter K, and the letter G. So you're going to see those pop up as we go through our words. So your first word is the word wrap, wrists, wrote, wreck, ring, write, Wreath, so all of these have the silent W in the beginning. Next we have knit, knife, night, knock, knee. So all of these have a silent K in the beginning. Now this knight, K-N-I-G-H-C, is like a knight in shining armor that, you know, defeats the dragon. It's not night like the opposite of daytime, it's nighttime. Next we have gnome. Sign, nause. Now, these all have a silent G in them. So this has a silent G in the beginning. This one has it in the middle of the word. 
and your last few words are the word heel, week, field, wristwatch, and knapsack. Now, week over here, W-E-A-K, doesn't mean like there are seven days in a week. W-E-A-K is the opposite of strong. So the opposite of strong is weak. All right, next we're going to get into your grammar notes. Okay, next we're going to talk about nouns. We're going to review common and proper nouns and we're going to introduce a new kind called collective nouns. Now we know that a common noun is a noun that names any person, place, or thing. So a cat, a dog, a house, a tree, a lamp, a girl, a boy, all these things can be any noun. It's not telling us specifically which one. So it's not telling me the name of the boy or the girl. It's not telling me uh, what kind of shoe it is. It's not telling me the name of the park or the building. Common nouns can be anything. Now a proper noun names the specific person, place, or thing. Proper nouns begin with a capital letter because they name something specific. And if there's more than one word in the proper noun, then the first letter of every important word is given a capital letter. And I'm going to go over some examples with you. So we're going to capitalize the names of the week, the names of the days of the week, uh, the names of months and holidays, any important words that are in a title of a publication, so like a book or a newspaper or an article, names of different languages, names of races and nationalities, and historical events. Also the names of products and any geographical locations, so the names of, you know, countries and cities, those are things that will also be capitalized. Now I did put a few examples for each one on how to do that, and you can see those right there on the screen. So for the days, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, obviously, all of those begin with a capital letter. The first letter in the name of all of the months is capital. Holidays like Memorial Day, Eid al-Adha, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, all of those begin with capital letters. The important words in a title of a book, like the mouse and the motorcycle, these two words that are in between that are not important words, the and and the the, we don't capitalize. The only time we would capitalize those is like you're seeing right here at the beginning when they're the first word in the title. Or if you look at the book, Where the Wild Things Are, again, you'll see the important words are capitalized. Any other words are not capitalized. The names of different languages, races, nationalities, uh, historical events like the Civil War, names of products like um, Nike shoes, geographic locations like Lake Tahoe or Niagara Falls, all of those are proper nouns because they tell us about a specific person, place, or thing. Now the next kind that we're going to talk about are called collective nouns. Collective nouns are words that describe a group. So some common collective nouns you've heard of are like the word family. A family is a group of related people. A herd is like a group of land animals like sheep or buffalo. A flock is a group of different kinds of birds. A litter is a group of baby animals like puppies or kittens. An army is a group of soldiers. A band is a group of musicians. A swarm is a group of flying insects like bees. So collective nouns are nouns that name a group of nouns, and, um, and you've already used a lot of them. If we say a class, you know, if we talk about the second grade class, we know that we're talking about all the students in second grade. Or if I talk about uh, the fifth grade class, I'm talking about all the students in fifth grade. Next, we're going to talk about prefixes and suffixes. Now, prefixes and suffixes are both word parts that are added on to a word. They come from the word affix, and affix means to stick or to attach to something. So what you're doing is you're going to stick or you're going to attach these parts to change the meaning of that root word or that base word that you're working with. So some of the most common 
prefixes and ones that you've used before are the prefix re, un, and dis. Now, when you're looking at these, you can see that there's a little dash that comes after the prefix. That means this is stuck on the beginning and it's attached to the rest of the word. So the prefix re means again. So if I ask you to rewrite something, I'm asking you to write it again. If your mom asks you to rewash something, she's asking you to wash it again. If you reread a story, that means you're reading it again. The next prefix is un, and un means not. So if you are unhappy, that means you're not happy. If something is unclean, that means it's not clean. If you feel like something is unfair, that means it's not fair. And the last prefix we're going to talk about today is dis. Dis means the opposite of something. Like if you dislike something, it's the opposite of liking it, you hate it. If something disappears, that means it's not appearing anymore, it's completely gone. Or if you are in dis. Okay, next we're going to talk about regular and irregular plural nouns. Now, regular plural nouns are ones where you add either an S or an ES to the end of the word to make it a plural. And remember, plural means more than one. So how do you know when to add an S or an ES? You know you have to add an ES if the ending of your word has an S, SH, CH, X, or Z as the final letter. So if you have a word that ends with S, like class, class becomes classes. And you can hear the is in when you're saying ES as opposed to when you're saying S, where you, instead of saying cats, it just says S at the end, but classes says is at the end. So you can hear the E and the S. So that's a word that ends with S. For SH, wish becomes wishes. Words that ends with CH are like watch, so watch becomes watches. A word that ends with X is like box, becomes boxes, and buzz becomes buzzes. So if your word ends with an S, SH, CH, X, or Z, you are going to use an ES at the end of it. Now, when do you add an S? We only add an S to the end of a word that doesn't have those same letters at the end or it ends with a vowel and the letter Y. If it ends with a vowel and the letter Y and anything other than these letters, then you only add the S to it, like cats, toys, shoes, books, schools, boys, girls. You just put an S. So this one, vowel and then Y, same thing over here, vowel and then Y. Now, sometimes you have a word that ends with a Y where you have to change that Y to an I. So if your word ends with a consonant letter plus the letter Y, then you change that Y to an I before you add the ES. So enemy becomes enemies, fly becomes flies, library becomes libraries, bunny becomes bunnies. So consonant letter, that means not a vowel. Consonant Y becomes I and then ES. Now I also want to talk to you about irregular plurals. So up here is regular plurals. Regular plurals end with an S or an ES, but irregular plurals do not. Irregular plural nouns have a different spelling when they become a plural. That means they do not follow the SES rule. So some examples of irregular plurals are ones that you know, like child becomes children, man becomes men, ox becomes oxen, person becomes people, goose becomes geese, tooth becomes teeth, foot becomes feet, and life becomes lives. And you can see that the spelling is changing when you're going from singular form to plural form. Now there are some words that don't change their spelling when they go from singular to plural. That means there's the same word when you're talking about one and if you're talking about more than one. So deer, you talk about one deer or a group of deer, one sheep or a flock of sheep, one pair of scissors or lots of scissors, one moose or lots of moose, one salmon or lots of salmon, one fish or lots of fish. So these are words that are 
that their spelling works for both singular and plural. And the way that you know which one it is, is by looking at the context clue. So look at the words around it, and they will tell you if that sentence is talking about one or more than one. So if I read a sentence that says, uh, the group of deer stopped by the stream. I know that the word group is telling me that it's more than one. Or if, it, or if it says, all the sheep were grazing in the meadow. So all tells me it's more than one. Or if I have a sentence that says, can you please pass me my scissors? I'm talking about myself and I'm just talking about my scissors. So it's one, that's singular. Or I saw a moose on the path. If it says a moose, a is referring to one. If, I, if it says I saw many moose on the path, many will tell me that it's more than one and so on. Now there's a special rule for most words that end with F or LF. And I say most words because there are words that don't follow that rule that we're going to talk about as well. So usually if a word ends with F or LF as the final letters, that F is going to become a V before you add ES. So calf becomes calves, half becomes halves, wife becomes wives, elf becomes elves. And these are all words that, that end with either that F and, you know, silent E over here, or LF in it, and you're changing that F to a V. Now, there are a couple of, of exceptions. Uh, one of them is the word roof. Roof becomes roofs. That does not change into a V. Or chef becomes chefs. That also does not change into a V. And lastly, we're going to talk about comparative and superlative forms. Now, when we're talking about comparative and superlative, these are words to compare between two adjectives. So when you're describing something, um, you use either ER in the comparative form or EST in the superlative form. Now, when we're comparing, we're usually talking about two things. So we add ER. So tall becomes taller. He is taller than his brother. So the two that I'm comparing is him and his brother. Big becomes bigger. And there's a reason I made this in bold. We're going to talk about it farther down in, in our notes. I can say this book is bigger than the last one. So I'm comparing this book to the last book, just the two things. Fast becomes faster. I can run faster than my sister. So I'm comparing myself to my sister. So just those two things. Now, when we're talking about superlative, we think super, so the most. And superlative is used to compare three or more things, and it usually has, is, has an EST at the end of it. So clean becomes cleanest. Her room is the cleanest in the whole house. So I'm comparing her room to all of the other rooms in the house. So that's more than two. Bright becomes brightest. The sun is one of the brightest stars in our galaxy. So I'm comparing the sun to all of the other stars. So it's more than two. Strong becomes strongest. Superman was the strongest superhero of them all. So I'm comparing Superman to all of the other superheroes, which again is more than two. Now, important rules that we want to remember over here. If a word ends with a vowel and then a consonant, we're going to double that final consonant before we add the ER or the EST. And this is where I'm, I told you I had highlighted uh, bigger, the G's and bigger, because it ends with a vowel and then a consonant. So I double that final consonant, and then I added the ER or the EST. Now I did the same thing with the word sad, sadder or saddest. Double that final consonant, and then I added the ER, double that final consonant, then I added the EST. Now, if a word ends with a consonant and then a Y, we're going to change that Y into an I before we add that ER or EST. 
So happy becomes happier or happiest. Dry becomes drier or driest. So consonant Y becomes consonant I, E, R, consonant I, E, S, T. And if a word ends with a silent E, we drop that final E before we add the E, R, or the E, S, T. So cute becomes cuter or cutest. Okay, let's get into our weekly stories. So we're going to open up our reading and writing workshop book, as well as our literature anthology. And we're going to hop into our unit two, week three stories. Genre, expository text. Vote by Eileen Cristolo. Suppose your town is about to choose a new mayor. How will you do it? You'll vote. Voting is a way to choose. You can vote for favorite books, movie stars, candy bars, or even puppies. I'm Chris Smith, candidate for mayor. I hope you'll vote for me. When I was a puppy at the dog pound, the Smiths came along. Looking for a puppy? They couldn't decide between me and a poodle, so they voted. I vote for the mutt. No, the poodle. Vote for the poodle, Angela. Mutt! If someone wants to be elected mayor, she needs to convince as many people as possible to vote for her. So if Chris gets the most votes, she'll be mayor. What does the mayor do? The mayor is the leader of the city. Let's go help Chris find some votes. You have my vote. I'm going to vote for Brown. Grrr, growl. You can't vote for Brown. Sparky, stop that. This country is a democracy. That means people have a right to vote for whoever they want. Many people just don't vote. Why not? Maybe they think their vote is like a little drop of water in an enormous ocean. Their vote is only one out of many, many votes. But sometimes, the winner of an election is decided by just a few votes. Vote for Chris Smith. Vote for Bill Brown. If people don't vote, they're letting everyone else decide for them. Well, I wish I could vote, but kids can't vote until they're 18. Who decided who could vote? When this country began, the Founding Fathers wrote a constitution. It said how we would govern ourselves. It said people should vote, but it didn't say who could vote. That was left to each state to decide, and that was a problem. Angry people protested. They wrote letters, they held rallies and made speeches, they marched, were arrested, and went on hunger strikes. Some were killed trying to claim their right to vote. But it took many years, four amendments to the Constitution, and several new laws before all citizens, 18 years or older, were allowed to vote. It took almost 80 years for black men to win the right to vote. It was 130 years before all women could vote. If you want to vote, you need to register. Where? At your town office. Or you can download a registration form from the Internet. Or you might even find a booth set up at a shopping mall or at a political rally. Do you want to join a political party? You've probably heard of the Democrats and the Republicans, but you could join the Green Party, the Libertarians, the America First Party, or the Progressives, to name just a few. Or you could be independent and not join any party at all.
You don't have to join a party. Why doesn't she want to go to a party? It's not a birthday party, it's a political party. Political parties are like clubs for voters who share similar ideas. Ideas about what? About government, schools, health care, environment, stadiums. Is there a party that thinks dogs should vote? Before you vote, you'll need to find out about the different candidates. How? Read newspapers, watch TV news, listen to the radio, or surf the internet. Do you agree with their ideas? How do we know if Chris will be a good mayor? She lets us sleep on the couch, that's important. You might have a chance to hear the candidates debate. You might even be able to ask questions. We need new schools. Classes are being held in halls. There you go again, spending our money. Before an election, everyone tries to guess who will win. Pollsters ask some of the voters whom they're planning to vote for. Then they estimate who will be the winner. But voters can change their minds. Someone just called to ask who I'm voting for. And you said, maybe Brown. What? But Smith is so much better. That pollster should have asked me. Do you need help? We sure do. We have to mail 14,000 letters by tonight. We're hoping you'll vote for Chris Smith. How can you help your candidate win? You can volunteer to answer phones, call voters, address envelopes, or hand out flyers. Campaigns need lots of help. And they need lots of money to help pay for phones, computers, stamps, flyers, and bumper stickers. And most of all, ads and more ads. Where will they find the money? What do the letters say? Please vote for Chris Smith and please donate money. You might want to donate a few dollars to your favorite candidate's campaign. Or maybe you'll be invited to a fundraising dinner. Would you like to pay $250 for a fancy hamburger and a chance to meet the candidate? If you donate lots of money, maybe the candidate will listen to you more than to other voters. Is that fair? Does that mean your vote will count more than other voters' votes? There's a lot of disagreement about this. By the last week of the campaign, everyone is tired. But the candidates make more speeches, they shake more hands, and they run more and more ads. Maybe, just maybe, they will convince another few voters to vote for them. See, we keep hearing Smith wants to spend all our money. That worries me. Chris Smith wants to spend your money. That's an ad for Brown. He's trying to worry us. Save your money. Vote for Bill Brown. Honest, reliable, a nice guy. Honest? That ad isn't honest. Brown makes sense to me. Some of these ads can be very misleading. I'm worried lots of these signs are for Brown. It's going to be a close election. Finally, it's election day. Stop and check. Reread. Why do candidates run more ads during the last week of the campaign? Reread to find out. Please sign in here. Your name? Dad, are you voting for Mom? He'd better vote for me. Why do they have to sign in? Most voters are assigned a particular place to vote. A school, a library, a church basement, wherever there is space for voting booths. What if you're away on voting day? You can get an absentee ballot in advance. Some places let people vote by mail or on the internet. 
A few places set up voting machines early. But however you vote, you get just one vote. You can't go back and vote again. To check if they're registered and to make sure they vote only once. In most places, people use voting machines. Many cities and towns are replacing old machines with new electronic ones. But in very small towns, voters still mark paper ballots with a pencil. However you do it, you'll vote in a private booth. No one can see how you vote. There's lots to vote for, the mayor and city council, and a question. Should dogs be on leashes in public places? I finally decided, but don't ask. Votes are secret. He voted for Brown. You peaked! When the voting ends, the counting begins. Who will win? Stay close to your TV or radio to find out. Usually a few hours after the polls close, the winner is announced. Looks like Brown is winning. Oh no, but there are still lots more votes to count. And the winner is my mom. Congratulations, Madam Mayor. I'll be Mayor Dog. We won! But wait, what if the election is won by only a few votes? The candidate who lost can ask that the votes be counted again. Then it could take a few days or longer to carefully recount the ballots and find out who really won. Uh-oh, Brown wants a recount? I'll tell her. What's wrong? I won by just 105 votes out of 35,000. That's why Bill Brown wants a recount. Do you think Chris will lose? She might. At last, the election is decided. In the end, someone does win, and someone does lose. The votes have been recounted. Bill Brown was correct. Mistakes were made. Smith actually has 203 votes more than Brown. Almost half the voters don't want Chris to be mayor. Look at the bright side. Slightly more than half do want her. Brown lost. I guess we won't get a new stadium. But we might build new schools. I'm going to write a letter to Chris Smith and tell her why this town needs a stadium. She needs to listen to all the voters. You aren't happy? You wish the other candidate had won? Well, remember, the mayor works for everyone, even the people who didn't vote for her. She'll need to listen to all the voters. After she is sworn in, the new mayor will have a few years to do her new job. What are they doing? Chris is being sworn in as mayor. I promise to do my best. She won't please all the people all the time, but if she does a good job, maybe the voters will elect her again. I wonder if I'll be sworn in as mayor, dog. Who says you get to be mayor, dog? What about me? Okay, so that takes us to the end of our first story. Our short story that also uses our vocabulary words is called A Plan for the People, and this is an expository text. So remember, expository texts give us information. They are nonfiction pieces of writing. A Plan for the People. The United States government started with a plan. Our country's leaders wrote the plan more than 200 years ago. The plan is called the Constitution. All of our laws come from the Constitution. The Constitution is the highest law in our country. A New Government In 1787, the United States was a new nation of 13 states. The nation's first plan for government had problems. 
Its leaders decided to meet to talk about a new plan. Fifty-five delegates came to the meetings. A delegate is a person who speaks for the citizens in each state. George Washington led the meetings. He was the country's first president. A summer of arguments. The meetings began on a hot day in May 1787. The delegates gathered together in the Philadelphia State House. They closed the windows because the meetings were secret. It was hot in the State House. When they opened the windows to cool off, bugs flew in. The delegates argued all summer in the hot, buggy rooms. Making a new plan for government was not easy or fun. Some delegates wanted one person to run the new government. Others thought a group should be in charge. They all agreed on one thing. A group should make laws for the country. But they disagreed on how to pick these leaders. The famous inventor and statesman Benjamin Franklin attended the meetings. He wondered how the group could ever make any decisions. Ben Franklin worried that the delegates would never agree. Making a Plan The delegates wrote their plan and called it the United States Constitution. The Constitution was only a few pages long, but it was full of big ideas. The Constitution shows how our government works. It says that people are in charge of the government. People vote to pick their leaders. These leaders run the government for the people. A government that's fair to all. The delegates planning the Constitution met for four months. They thought the Constitution was a good plan, but not all delegates signed in on September 15, 1787. Some of them wanted to make sure the government protected people's rights too. A right is something you are allowed to have or do. In 1791, Congress changed the Constitution to protect the rights of American citizens. One right allows people to speak freely. These changes were called the Bill of Rights. After many months, leaders agreed on a U.S. Constitution. A lot has changed since 1787. Our country is a lot bigger. There are 50 states now. The Constitution has been changed many times, too. But one thing has not changed. The Constitution is still the plan for our government. Rights for Children In 1959, many countries signed a Declaration of the Rights of the Child. Here are some of those rights. Children should grow up free. Children should get an education. Children should have the chance to play. What other rights should children have? This chart shows one class's ideas. Each student voted. What rights should children have? Be safe from bullies. Own a pet. Play safely. Go to school. Number of votes. All right, that takes us through to the end of our stories in our literature anthology. Let's go ahead and take a look at our reading and writing workshop. So again, we're on unit two, week three, and our story is Every Vote Counts. Genre expository. Every vote counts. Vote for the class pet. Essential question. How do people make government work? Read about one group that teaches kids the power of voting. Have you ever voted? Maybe you voted to choose a class pet. Maybe your family voted on which movie to see. If you have ever voted, then you know how good it feels. Voting is important. It tells people what you think. Many years ago, the leaders of our country wanted to know what people thought, too. They wrote a plan for our government. It is called the Constitution. 
It gives men and women in the United States the right to vote. Each year, people who are 18 years and older pick new leaders. They also vote on new laws. Voting gives Americans the power to choose. Teaching Kids to Vote Did you know that only about 6 out of every 10 Americans vote? That's sad. Some people think that voting is too hard. They are unsure where to go to vote. They think it takes too much time. Now a group called Kids Voting USA is trying to convince everyone to vote. Kids Voting USA teaches kids that voting is important. The group gives teachers lessons to use in their classrooms. First, kids read stories and do fun activities about government. They also learn how to choose and elect a good leader. Election Day is here. First, we sign in. Then we mark a ballot. Finally, we vote. Next, kids talk with their families. They reread stories about candidates. These are the people who want to be chosen as leaders. Families discuss their ideas and make decisions. That way, when it's time to vote, kids know who they want to vote for. On Election Day, kids get to vote just like adults. They use ballots like the ones in real elections. A ballot is a special form with the names of candidates on it. Kids mark their choices on the ballot. Then they put the ballot into a special box. Finally, all the votes are counted and recounted. The winners are announced and everyone knows who won. Vote Now Voting helps kids learn how to be independent and think for themselves. It also gives them the power to share how they feel. Kids Voting USA wants kids to vote now. There's a good reason. They estimate that when these kids grow up, more of them will vote. In about 10 years, kids your age will be old enough to vote. You will have the power to help elect great leaders and make new laws. Isn't that exciting? Elections are held in many schools to teach kids how to vote. This bar graph shows the results of a class election. Which pet was the favorite? Vote for a class pet. Hamster. Hermit crab. Guinea pig. Mouse. Okay, next we're going to get into our comprehension. Now, our strategy for this week is one that we've had before, and that's to reread. That means we're going to read again so we can get a better understanding of what the author is trying to tell us. And for our comprehension skill, we're going to be thinking about the author's point of view. So what that means is we're going to look at the author's perspective or see what the author uh, thinks and feels about a subject. So their point of view are their thoughts or their feelings on it. Reread. Stop and think about the text as you read. Do you understand what you are reading? Does it make sense? Reread to make sure you understand. Find text evidence. Do you understand why the author thinks voting is important? Reread the first part of page 135. Have you ever voted? Maybe you voted to choose a class pet. Maybe your family voted on which movie to see. If you have ever voted, then you know how good it feels. Voting is important. It tells people what you think. Many years ago, the leaders of our country wanted to know what people thought too. They wrote a plan for our government. It is called the Constitution. It gives men and women in the United States the right to vote. I read that voting is a way to tell people what you think. It is a way for people to choose new laws and leaders. Now I understand why the author thinks voting is important. Author's Point of View 
The author often has an opinion or point of view about a topic. Look for opinions and details that show how the author feels. Compare your feelings with the author's. Find text evidence. How does the author feel about voting? I can reread and look for details that tell me what the author thinks. This will help me figure out the author's point of view. Graphic organizer. Details. The title of the story is Every Vote Counts. The author thinks it's sad that only six out of every ten Americans vote. Voting gives Americans the right to choose. Point of view. Voting is important. Everyone should vote. Details help you figure out the author's point of view. All right, next we're going to talk about the genre, which is uh, expository text. Now, remember we said an expository text gives us information, so we know that it's a nonfiction text. And we're also going to touch briefly on prefixes again uh, as our vocabulary strategy, like we covered in our notes earlier. Expository text. Every Vote Counts is an expository text. Expository text gives facts and information about a topic, has headings that tell what a section is about, includes text features such as bar graphs. Find text evidence. I can tell that every vote counts is nonfiction. It gives facts about voting. It also has headings and a bar graph. Text features. Headings. Headings tell what a section of text is mostly about. Bar graph. A bar graph is a special kind of picture. It helps you understand numbers and information in a quick and easy way. Prefixes. A prefix is a word part added to the beginning of a word. It changes the meaning of the word. The prefix UN means not. The prefix RE means again. Find text evidence. In every vote counts, I see this sentence. They reread stories about candidates. The word reread has the prefix RE. I know that the prefix RE means again. The word reread must mean read again. They reread stories about candidates. All right. This takes us to the end of our language arts notes. Please let me know if you guys had any questions. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Take care. Bye bye.